post-Soviet Central Asia, corruption, economic stagnation, and kleptocracy was and still is the norm. However, in 2005, the Kyrgyz people decided it wasn't for them. Hello, my name is David and welcome to Eurasia. Before we get started, I just wanted to remind you to, like always, click the subscribe button. After all, you can always change your mind later. Nonetheless, without further ado, let's get into the 2005 Tulip Revolution in Kyrgyzstan, right now. Unlike in Eastern Europe, most Central Asians were happy, or at least content, under Soviet rule, especially after the Stalin era. In fact, today, every two in three Central Asians say that life under the Soviet Union was overall better. Thus, it comes at no surprise that when the Soviet Union started to collapse, the Central Asian people were not too hesitant at former Soviet leaders coming out of the USSR's destruction as leaders once again. However, no longer was Moscow in charge and checking these leaders, and many would quickly make moves to corrupt the newly created democratic system to keep them in power. Perhaps this is no better seen than in Turkmenistan, where, within only five years, President Sapar Murat Niyazov declared himself president for life while forcing his cult of personality onto the Turkmen people. Turkmenistan is an amplified example, but this happened all throughout the Soviet Union. In Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko has held on to power there for 30 years. In Kazakhstan, Nusrtan Nazarbayev would do the same exact thing. And in the Kyrgyz SSR in the 1980s, a communist loyalist and engineer by trade named Askar Akayev was quickly rising the ranks of the Communist Party. By 1989, he had become the president of the Kyrgyz Academy of Sciences, a prestigious university in Kyrgyzstan even into today. Like many Soviet politicians, Akayev's loyalty to the Communist Party and specialty in a blue-collar trade made him extremely competitive for higher positions. When the policies of Glasnost and Perestroika would eventually lead to the creation of the Soviet presidency in October of 1990, two candidates would compete for the position. However, Interestingly, in Soviet republics, if neither candidate receives the majority of the votes, then a second round of voting is done, and neither of the original candidates can run again. Akayev, who was seen as a compromise candidate, would be elected in the second round. Needless to say, Akayev's presidency in the Kyrgyz SSR would be short. The Soviet Union would fall by the end of the next year, and Akayev would assume the presidency of the newly created Kyrgyz Republic after a makeshift election following the USSR's collapse. Yet, like all of his Central Asian counterparts, Akayev would use the next four years before the next elections to grab as much power as possible, while also ensuring his re-election in the 1995 elections. By the 1995 elections, Akayev had succeeded, and won with 72.4% of the votes. The same would happen in 2000, where Akayev won with 76.4% of the vote. Akayev, who had now been president for a decade under the terrible economic conditions that followed the collapse of the USSR, saw the Kyrgyz people starting to demand change. Yet, the first domino collapsed in 2002, when an extremely popular parliament member representing Kyrgyzstan's third largest city of Jalalabad named Azimbek Beknozarov was arrested for apparent abuse of power. 2,000 citizens of Jalalabad began protesting, and police met them with force. By the end of the day, five people were dead and dozens were injured. These protests would move into the capital city of Bishkek within the next few days. Akayev ignored the protesters, but the police did not, and they were brutally violent with them. Akayev's lack of attention to it would lead to the protests becoming larger and larger year by year, either in remembrance of the Jalalabad protest victims, Beknazarov's arrest, or for other reasons against Akayev. By the coming of the 2005 elections, Akayev had listened and promised to not run in the 2005 elections. However, as has or will have happened in nearly all other Central Asian republics to date, the Kyrgyz people were scared of Akayev's family or friends coming to power, while he de facto stayed in power. Their fears were met with evidence when, in the 2005 parliament elections, which are six months before the presidential elections, both of his children ran and won seats in the parliament. To the people of Kyrgyzstan, the elections were undoubtedly rigged, and they realized they needed to do something before it was too late. On March 13, 2005, the same day that elections were held, riots broke out throughout the entire country. In Jalalabad, protesters stormed government buildings. In Osh, the second largest city in Kyrgyzstan, the same happened, and protesters shut down the airport there, essentially cutting the country in two due to the high and impassable mountains that separate the north and south of Kyrgyzstan, 
especially in the winter, as it was at the time. Akayev had his hands tied behind his back, but he refused to talk to the protesters as they demanded. Instead, he called the protesters misled by foreign interests and propaganda. He refused to resign, and within a week, thousands of protesters were demanding Akayev's resignation outside of the Kyrgyz Republic's White House itself, with thousands more protesting across the country. On March 23rd, Akayev fired both the interior minister and the general prosecutor of Kyrgyzstan because, to him, they hadn't dealt with the protests well enough. It thus became apparent to the protesters that Akayev did not understand the demands of the protesters, and by the end of the day, on the 24th, the presidential compound was stormed by protesters. Akayev fled to first Kazakhstan and then Russia, where he remains today. On April 11, 2005, Akayev's official resignation was accepted by the Kyrgyz Republic's parliament. However, Akayev's departure on March 25th was hardly the end of the crisis. Kurmanbek Bakiyev, the prime minister of Kyrgyzstan from 2000 to 2002, took on the role of president while the government reorganized and fixed itself. However, this process was complete chaos. Constitutional problems caused confusion in both the legislature and executive branch. The confusion caused riots to again spring up against the government. Starting on June 1st, angered with a lack of progress on the new government, protesters stormed the Supreme Court building for a month. The next week, a congressman was killed on June 10th, apparently for his comments made about a major protest leader from the South. Uncoincidentally, on the same day, riots had broke out again in Osh, killing one. On June 13th, the list of official candidates for the presidency was released, and the riots again grew in size. The two main candidates, Bakiyev and Felix Kulov, agreed that Kulov would drop out of the race and become prime minister, when Bakiyev would assumably become president. Another popular candidate, named Urmat Biek Barik Tabasov from Kyrgyzstan's fourth largest city of Karakol, was deemed ineligible for his assumed citizenship to Kazakhstan, causing hundreds to riot in Karakol and storm the government buildings there. Other smaller examples happened all throughout the country, and by election day on July 10th, 2005, only seven candidates were deemed eligible. Needless to say, Bakiyev won with an unsurprising 89.5% of the vote, and on August 14th, he would officially assume the presidency. The Kyrgyz people initiated the Tulip Revolution to oust and ward off autocrats from their country. But even the Kyrgyz people knew that, though Akayev had fled, they were not successful. Bakiyev, for many, was worse, and his five-year administration was marred with even more corruption, shady leadership, and questionable choices, which would lead to the Kyrgyz people starting another revolution against him himself in 2010. However, that in itself deserves a second video. The Tulip Revolution exemplifies an extremely important case study in revolts and revolutions. The aftermath is just as important as the events and complaints that led to the revolution itself, and the Kyrgyz people learned that the hard way. Nonetheless, their dedication for creating a government for them, led by them, and by them, is something that few post-Soviet republics can say they have, and, without a doubt, it plays a huge part in what it means to be a citizen of Kyrgyzstan today. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like the video, and as I mentioned before, don't forget to subscribe. It helps me out so much. Nonetheless, like always, stay happy, stay humble, stay hopeful, and goodbye.